Well, good afternoon, everyone. Textbooks have played a bit of a, or I should say libraries, have played a bit of an odd role, or we've occupied an uncertain space in the whole textbook ecosystem. And on one hand, you have the faculty, and they are largely the deciders when it comes to determining what's the appropriate learning content that they want to use for their courses. And sometimes those choices are influenced by pub the publishers or perhaps somebody else, like a department chair. And on the other hand, you have the students. And they are in the role of the somewhat passive consumer of the learning content, for, for better or worse. And we know that in the textbook ecosystem, that's part of the challenge that students don't always understand why they're being required to purchase a particular textbook or how it's going to help them. And it can be particularly frustrating when there's not a good sync up between the faculty and what they've decided and what the students are actually then required to obtain. Now, the library's in, there, in the mix there somewhere where, on one hand, the faculty have not traditionally involved us very much in that decision-making process about what is the most appropriate learning content for their courses. But on the other hand, the students increasingly see that the library should have some sort of role in helping them to obtain the content that they need for their courses. Thus, we often have students asking us whether we have the textbook, encouraging us to buy every single textbook that's in the bookstore, those types of things. So in our presentation today, we're going to cover some of those issues and thinking more about what is the role of the library in the textbook e ecosystem and acknowledging that at many of our institutions, we're moving from that role of uncertainty to a more certain space where we're trying to uh, start this textbook revolution on our campuses and play more of a role at the end where the faculty are making decisions about what the learning content is and possibly giving them an, a way that they can create more of their own content. And we'll talk more about that, but we want to focus our energy on the importance of partnerships in making these revolutions happen on our campuses. And that, again, we've, we've seen different perspectives on where does that come into play? Is that at the very beginning? Is that somewhere in the middle? Who do you involve? There are a lot of questions, and we hope to offer some advice on those matters. I want to start to frame the topic, though, with a short video. And it's not that you'll see anything particularly uh, unusual or shocking in this video, but I think it can help frame some of the issues as to why we're getting involved in the tech book ecosystems in a way that we haven't before. Book prices are notoriously high, uh, really high, but you got to get them somewhere. So exactly how much are students paying? Probably about 500 a semester. Uh, $500. I pay about $750. About $400. Today's prices have many students searching for alternatives to the campus bookstore. I buy online now all the time if I can. Cause I, I bought a couple online, yeah. I just don't want to pay the full price at the bookstore. Some books are really bad about making very, very small changes to the textbook and uh, just calling it a new edition. New or used, cheap or expensive, some students don't buy their books at all. I don't always buy the textbook that is required for every class. I usually go to class first, see if I need the book. If I need the book, then I will buy the book online. I have to sit and evaluate the professors because sometimes you don't need the sometimes book. Sometimes <laughs> the teacher doesn't use the book, yeah, so. I don't know. I go to class like a week before I buy it, usually. Oh. Well, like, if my friend has the book, then I would go to her room and I'd read the chapter that I need to read or that I look at the pictures I need to look at because sometimes I don't read all the chapters because right. there's no point. <laughs> now, whether it's national surveys or anecdotal evidence that you've heard on your own campus. I think these are all the types of things that we are all hearing about textbooks at our institutions. Students are not purchasing them. Faculty are telling us that students are not coming to class prepared having read the material. 
Faculty are frustrated with textbooks that seem out of date or do not speak to the way that they would like to teach the course or have what they want the students to be learning. Students waiting to find out what the cost of a textbooks will be or whether they'll actually need the textbooks. And I think we all have our own anecdotes. We all have our own textbook stories to tell. For example, I happen to have been on the reference desk earlier this semester. A student came to the desk and said that they needed to read the first two chapters of their textbook for the next day. I did all the things we would all do to see what I could do to find that book. We actually had a copy of that book, but it had already been borrowed by another student, which is very common. And I searched, tried to find some full text somewhere, couldn't do it. But I think what the student said to me is what really caught caught my attention, she said, well, don't worry, I'm going to go to the bookstore and I'm going to use my phone camera to take pictures of the pages that I need to read. And I thought, that might work, but that's not a good solution. We're not doing something right if that's the way that students are thinking about obtaining their learning content. That can't be the way that we help our students be academically successful at our institution. So these are all the types of reasons why we care about starting a textbook revolution on our campus. In this talk today, you're going to hear three things related to partnering for starting the textbook revolution. Allison's going to share some of what's happening at The Ohio State University, where they are partnering with their colleagues for developing open educational resources and creating open learning opportunities for their students. And then Kevin from Simon Fraser University, I think will share some interesting information about a project they have in, developed for open textbook platforms. And I think these are, when I say the, library, the role of the library is changing in the textbook ecosystem, these are two of the exact type of examples that we can share, that we're working with faculty to develop the resources, both uh, learning objects and complete open textbooks, and introducing them to it. And then I'll talk a little bit about five institutional strategies uh, that we could all possibly take advantage of in making better use of partners to not only start these revolutions, but to bring them to fruition so that we get the, the type of results we want with respect to our place in the textbook ecosystem. So I'll turn this over to Allison. Thanks, Stephen. I'm Allison Armstrong from the Ohio State University Libraries. And when we talk about open educational resources on the OSU campus, that conversation runs in tandem around affordability. So a key strategy for university libraries in our work with OERs is to bring together stakeholders, work collaboratively to develop and deepen partnerships that fully leverage existing talent and resources. Here we have a picture of Michael Drake. He's the president of Ohio State University, our most recently elected student government uh, vice president and president, and a web page from the um, Department of Higher Education. From the president, we hear affordability, access and excellence. Those are his three pillars around his Vision 2020. Of great concern to students and voiced passionately is debt, uh, education debt. And our um, newly elected leaders were swept into office on a 77-page platform that focused largely on reducing um, the cost and increasing the affordability at OSU. And then in February of 2015 from our governor, he signed an executive order establishing the Ohio Task Force on Affordability and Efficiency in Higher Education. Academic leadership, student voice, and state imperatives are a powerful combination. Within the university libraries, our outreach and education 
colleague is the point person for OERs within the learning environment. That person works very closely with our teaching and learning unit, and those are within one division uh, within the library, so we partner also across divisions. We have copyright resources, digital content services, which is uh, akin to a scholarly communication area, and with our collections. So we have a complicated landscape where we work to build partnerships so that we can keep track of, of who's doing what, because we work with campus partners as well. Out of the office of our chief information officer, we partner with our online distance education and e-learning unit. And our OCIO funds in part the, some of the positions within our copyright resource center. So we have a, a great partnership there. We're also trying to work with our student government. Um, that can be somewhat of a moving target since they do turn over regularly, but it seems that within the past two years, the affordability piece has a sustained, um, even with the change of leadership. Our main partnership then with the um, ODEE group is to help um, prepare the campus and have our faculty move to working with uh, OERs. And one of the first things we did together was to invite the uh, Open Textbook Initiative, those, the folks from the University of Minnesota to campus to speak to technologists, librarians, and faculty to help them understand the landscape. Here we have the uh, library's affordability page. So in addition to the work that we do with um, our campus colleagues, when we talk about open educational resources, we include in those library resources that may be licensed to the campus. So we have a pretty broad definition of what we consider to be open. Uh, and working with faculty, whether they're library licensed content or freely available web resources, things that are in the public domain, anything that they wish to use, we want to support them in their effort to do that. So after the conversations um, with the University of Minnesota and setting up uh, our faculty as much as we could to have them understand uh, a little bit about the, the OER landscape, we initiated a series of grants. And the grants that the libraries, OD, and student government support are small grants, $1,000 each, to help faculty, just to incentivize them to explore um, walk down the path and use alternatives to expensive textbook. It's been quite successful. In one semester, we saved um, students over $400,000. For example, with an intro to social psych class, there were 500 students enrolled, and if all of them did not buy the $75 textbook, we saved almost uh, $38,000. Likewise, for an engineering textbook, 400 enrollment, $180 a textbook, that's almost $50,000. We targeted large enrollment classes uh, as a matter of course, but we found that we've had faculty who were teaching very small literature classes uh, take advantage of the grant. So it kind of runs the gamut. We work, as I mentioned, with the OD group. They've put out a brand to help the campus identify the place to go for open education resource support, and that's our affordable learning exchange. In addition to the small grants that we've done together, ODI has initiated larger grants that are um, thousands of dollars and also offer technical support, so that if you're really, a faculty member is really looking to convert um, their approach in a big way, in a sustained way, they can get some uh, traction uh, with both finance and um, technical support. Another initiative that we worked on with OD was OpenStax, an initiative out of Rice University. Again, we were trying to target large enrollment classes. We had some experimentation around this, people looking at those textbooks. Uh, no adoption, but we did have, again, some experimentation. Also under the Affordable Learning Exchange, 
we have continuation of education. So OD offers half hour online workshops on things such as using open educational resources in your online class. They sponsored four half hour, um, hour long workshops. The libraries were one of those workshops introducing faculty to how they might use library content as an alternative to textbooks. So our library and campus partners, we also work within a different environment, a larger environment. The Inter-University Council of Ohio is 13 uh, large public universities, and this is the group that's responding to the uh, governor's um, uh, task force report. The CIC, the um, Committee on uh, Cooperation as our regional consortium. We operate within there. And then on the national level, we're working with an organization called Unison. So for the state of Ohio, as I mentioned, the governor had signed that executive order, and that um, resulted in a task force with various reports. The uh, IUC got together, the technologist faculty libraries, have a working group that is focused on one of the recommendations. We've submitted a grant. Sadly, it was turned back to us. Uh, but we will continue to, uh, to work towards being um, affordable and efficient, which is what the governor has called for. Um, with our CIC colleagues, uh, we are operating in a little bit broader landscape. So the context opens up a little bit beyond um, OERs to the digital learning environment. And at the end of May in Madison, Wisconsin, the uh, library group of the CIC will get together and start discussing that. And then within the national organization, our engagement is also on the digital learning ecosystem within Unison. And I'll just close with a quote from Inside Higher Education article on that. Different universities point to different reasons for joining Unison in the first place. Iowa, for example, stressed content management and learning analytics. Oregon State, a desire to live up to its land-grant status. And Ohio State, accessibility and affordability. We want to be in control of our paths and where we go, said Mike Hoffer, Chief Information Officer at Ohio State. When you come together and put Florida and Indiana and Michigan and Iowa at the table, you really could have a much different conversation than you could singularly. Hopefully, that's for the better. And with that, I will turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Allison. So my name is Kevin Stranick, and I work at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm part of our university's public knowledge project. And in my section today, I wanted just to talk a bit about our work in developing a, an open textbook publishing platform. And this was really in the context of the growth of library-based publishing. And I know a lot of you who are here are involved in that and have seen that growth um, that we've shared in over the past decade or more. Um, we've been part of that at Simon Fraser University and at our public knowledge project by creating free open source software for journal publishing, open journal systems, as well as open conference systems for conferences and open monograph press for book publishing. And what we've started to hear from our community of users is uh, this growing interest in open textbooks. Um, as library-based publishing programs came together, libraries were realizing they wanted to expand their role from the consumption of resources into the production of those resources. Um, and open textbooks were a logical extension of that. Um, there was also, I think, a growing desire to become more involved with the open education movement in general and get more involved in the pedagogy that takes place in the classrooms. Within the, the sort of this interest in open textbooks, there is definitely a desire to start creating new ones, but also to work on making adaptations of existing textbooks so that they could meet local needs. Um, when we think about the library-based publishing, it's important to keep in mind that this is certainly true in the United States, it's certainly true in Canada, but it's happening around the world. Um, one of the things that we've been 
um, maybe we're unexpecting or surprised by is with our open journal system software, over half of our users are in the developing world. And some of the, the feedback we're getting from those same folks is that they're also interested in open textbooks. But they're really looking for ways to become part of an open textbook movement that isn't just about taking a North American textbook and using that, but actually putting their own voices out there in a way that is unique to their own local circumstances. You can imagine taking a geography textbook from the United States that talks about the Great Plains and goes into great detail. How useful is that in Africa? It has, it has its uses, but if you could take the core of that information and adapt it to those local needs, that's what a lot of our partners are interested in, uh, in setting up and, in, and uh, exploring. So in response to this, we thought, well, let's look at setting up uh, an open textbook publishing platform. Of course, it would be free and it would be open source. Everything that we make um, is built with that philosophy in mind. We're going to be building it off of our existing open monograph press software, which has just undergone a, a year-long complete overhaul and which is going to be released at the end of this month, fingers crossed. Um, and it's going to provide something that we've heard from the, our friends in the community is missing. It's going to provide a professional publishing workflow that includes submission, peer review, copy editing, production, and dissemination. Um, that's where we've um, really excelled with our journal software, with our monograph software, and we're looking forward to bringing that into the textbook space as well. As an open system, though, it's important to keep in mind that it can interoperate with other systems. I know a lot of sites are using Pressbooks very successfully. That's a WordPress-based, again, open source system for uh, book publishing. Um, and we're looking at ways to make our software interoperate seamlessly with that one. And again, in that sort of spirit of community collaboration, the University of Illinois already has an existing project to look at just that. Um, not specifically on textbooks, but around monographs and press books. And we're certainly going to be uh, leveraging the work that they're doing to further that interoperability. And of course, again, as open source software, you can take that, you can download it, you can set it up locally and use it. That's great, that's perfectly fine, and that's the way we've largely been operating. But we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to explore something different. And that's where the concept of platform cooperativism comes into this. As, a, as another research project that we've got going on um, through, our, through our director, John Molinsky, who's a professor at Stanford, we're exploring the viability of open access scholarly publishing cooperatives, uh, primarily focused on journals. And we're learning a lot of lessons about the value that cooperativism can bring in rethinking about how scholarly, scholarly publications are created. And especially in terms of thinking of an alternative to the commercial-based model that is increasingly becoming dependent on very high APCs. We're very curious as to whether there's another way of organizing this. And we thought, well, if co-ops can work for open access journal publishing, why can't they also maybe work for textbooks? And that's what we're going to try to answer with this pilot project that we're starting now. If you're not familiar with the concept of platform cooperativism, this is sort of a term that's gaining um, sort of more familiarity out on the internet with places like the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation who are looking at alternatives in how our economies were organized. I think in some ways it's coming as a response to the so-called shared economy that sort of taking up a lot of air in the room about what exactly does an alternative look like and tries to propose a more democratic and transparent um, cooperative alternative to that. And one of the keys to that is that it keeps ownership and control within the community that uses it. So if we're, you know, if we're thinking about this, if we're thinking about a new model, we really needed to try to explain why we think a co-op is, is the way to go about this. And there's a number of advantages to the co-op model. I mean, one of the probably most obvious ones is it provides access to the technology. So we've got a number of partners out there who are already using our journal software. They've been asking for access to the technology that can allow them to do textbooks, and this would provide access to that. In addition, 
because we'd all be members within a cooperative, it would provide them with direct input into the software development. So as we're making decisions about new functionality, new features, priorities, our partners around the table would all be able to have a voice in that and vote on what they think the priorities are for the open textbook cooperative. The other thing that I think is, is interesting and one that we haven't really had an opportunity to do much with but are just sort of to, to think more about is how much we can operate at scale. How much can we leverage having a centralized system operating more like a software as service that can take in multiple partners from around the world. So if you can imagine that you might have a, you know, a geography professor who wants to write a textbook on geography, working in the system, making the submission, but maybe can take advantage of reviewers from a geography department at your school or from your school. You don't all have to be within the same institution. It gives us more people and more shared resources. That's something that we're definitely going to be looking at. But perhaps the most important one are, go back right to the roots of cooperativism. And if you go back to the Rochdale principles of 1844, um, there's seven key internationally recognized cooperative principles that I feel really resonate with this project, but as a librarian, they resonate with me as a librarian as well. And I wanted to share those with you within the context of what we're doing and why we think this is a good way to go. One of the key principles is to have open and voluntary membership so that anyone is free to join, but also anyone is free to leave. If they find that it's not working from them, they're able to leave, and they can take their data with them. That's not owned or held by anyone. It is a free association. It's also democratic, and it has democratic member control, so all the decision-making about the platform would be made by the members who would take votes on priorities or different directions they wanted to go in. It's not going to be Simon Fraser University coming in and saying this is the way it is. It'll actually be the membership making those kinds of decisions. And this also goes for the economics as well. There's full member economic participation. So this means that members all pay an equitable um, contribution to the running of the system, but that all of the financial management is transparent and democratically controlled. Autonomy and independence are a key part of cooperatives and they would apply here as well. As I mentioned earlier, it, this will be piloted at Simon Fraser University, but it doesn't mean that Simon Fraser University owns it. So that if after a year or two years, the cooperative decided, you know what, we'd be better off going over here, they can do that because they're in control of their project. Education and training are at the heart of cooperativism and they'd also be central to a project like this in terms of building that publishing capacity. Groups like the Library Publishing Coalition are already working on this kind of professional development for libraries and library librarians and library staff, and this would be a core component to this kind of a platform cooperative. Another key principle is cooperati cooperation with other cooperatives. There's not a lot of publishing cooperatives around right now. It's still a new idea, but we expect to see this grow, and we expect to see there are an increasing amount of opportunities to work with other like-minded folks who see that these principles are the way that they want to proceed and we can share resources and expertise. And the last one, and this one really resonates with me and I think it will with many of you, the seventh principle is concern for the community. Cooperatives don't function to make a profit or to meet shareholder value. They get together and they do their work to make a contribution to the community. And I think that's how libraries function as well. We may be getting together to form an open textbook cooperative to create textbooks, but the ultimate, ultimate goal is something much bigger than that. It's more like student savings and even more than that, increased student learning outcomes. So if we can contribute to that, that's a, a key component of our work and meets that seventh principle of concern for the community. So I'll wrap it up there and pass it back to you, Stina. So I'm Stephen Bell. I'm from Temple University. 
libraries in Philadelphia, and I've largely had the responsibility for our campus textbook affordability strategy, at least the role of the library in getting that going. Now, I'm not gonna talk too much about the specifics of what it is we're doing. If I did, it would probably sound quite a bit like what Allison shared, you know, there's an incentive for faculty. Uh, we uh, encourage the same sort of things. We see similar results in terms of uh, savings to students. So what I'd like to focus on more specifically, particularly for those who are just getting started or thinking of developing some sort of textbook strategy at your institution, what are five institutional strategies that you can employ to try to create more of a partnering environment and hopefully make progress at a faster rate than we did at Temple University Libraries. Now, I know this sounds really obvious, that if you're gonna do anything in a large academic institution, you should probably try to get some partners. That makes a lot of sense. That's exactly what we didn't do. <laughs> uh, now, admittedly, we started this in 2010. There were not a lot of models. There were not a lot of examples. Um, I basically uh, had heard Nicole Allen at the time of a public interest research group talking about textbook issues, affordability, and thought this might be a great thing for us to start at our institution. I went to our dean and said, hey, would you happen to have $10,000 handy so that we could uh, do something and encourage faculty to stop using commercial textbook and start using other types of content? And uh, fortunately, the dean said, sure, let's give that a try, took a risk. And you know, I could have, I guess, spent more time trying to line up partners and figure out a better way to do this, but it seemed like I have the money, we better get going with this and show some results. Now, admittedly, I did consult with our teaching, learning, and technology roundtable. Those kinds of uh, groups that have some institutional representation can be helpful. There's some faculty, there's the, in the instructional folks, computing, and so on. Uh, they were supportive, they said, okay, go ahead, you know, let's see what happens. And I think that was important because if you're gonna do some type of project where you're gonna ask faculty to submit proposals that have to be vetted and it's a competitive process, you really wanna have some faculty involved in that process of, of reviewing the proposals and helping to make the decisions. You don't want that to just be folks from the library and administrators. Finally, five years later, we have a campus-wide textbook affordability task force that I think does have a lot of the right people in the room to talk about how do we get this to the next level beyond just having 10 grants a year for faculty to stop using a commercial textbook. So we've got number one, people like the bookstore, disability services, because accessibility is a critical issue here, teaching and learning center, they can be truly instrumental because they have the real connections with faculty in creating workshops, getting the word out, and all those important things. And there's a whole bunch of other people, including the registrar, and I'll touch on why it's important to maybe get the registrar involved in this process. So again, maybe something that's a little bit obvious, if you're the library and you're providing the funding for this, you probably do want to be involved in a leadership capacity within your partnering group. Uh, but I don't think that necessarily means you have to be at the head of the table. And in fact, it's probably better now in retrospect and looking ahead that it's much more interesting to see how this is shaping up with other people taking the leadership and the library being somewhat in the background and providing support, funding, or whatever it takes to make this happen. And it's great to see that faculty members, a student, uh, the Teaching and Learning Center, a high-level academic administrator taking on the leadership role, sort of like what we say about leadership, that you want to be the influencer, and then you want to see other people take this, your cause on and make it their own. And if they think they're the ones that are leading it, so much the better. Uh, just an example, though, of the way that a librarian on this group can be a leader is to provide information, find the latest research results, get that out there. Uh, also involve partners who are not immediately obvious and show examples of why those people need to be at the table. So for example, I mentioned the registrar. One of the things I discovered at our institution is that students cannot find out how much their textbooks cost until after they have registered for the course. But I found an example, Maricopa Community College 
actually let students find out what their textbooks are going to cost when they're trying to figure out what courses they want to take. And it can be very powerful when students can see that a certain section of a course does not require any textbook costs. That could really help them to make those important decisions about what courses do they want to take. And let's face it, students have all kinds of factors that they use when deciding what their courses are going to be like. I don't want to take a class on Friday, so I'm going to avoid those at all possible costs. So there are lots of ways that you can still lead and set the path without needing to be the leader of your partnering group. I would always encourage you to try to find ways to see what others have done, look at the models that are out there. I'm really excited about the fact that many libraries and institutions are now coming on board with textbook affordability projects like the two that you've heard and there are others in the audience who are doing things and some of you are here today because you've heard about it, you're excited and you want to try to get something going on your campus. But please take advantage of all the information, the models, the examples, the evaluative reports, the surveys, all of the information that's already out there. I'm always amazed when a new library comes on board and they uh, create a, you know, a new OER resource guide. They may, in fact, ask some of us if they can use what we already have. Many of us put Creative Commons license on it, so you can just go ahead and feel free to use everything we've already done. Uh, but surprisingly, people do tend to reinvent the wheel and create their own. And I hope we can get to the point where we have more of like a national data bank or resource where we can all go to for that same type of information. And our informal lib OER group that some of us are members of, and that is uh, kind of organized and sponsored by Nicole Allen of Spark, uh, we're trying to figure out some of these exact things. How do we stop all doing the same thing and start working together to make something that's available that everybody can use and is productive for all of us. Now, if you don't recognize those two folks in that picture, uh, those are mascots from the Student Public Interest Research Group's 2011 textbook revolution campaign in which they had these two characters going out to different campuses to create this idea of uh, a textbook revolution. And I can't say enough about the importance of partnering with students. I don't know why I didn't do that right from the start. Um, we, I've gone out to the student government groups. I've talked to them. I've tried to get them excited about this, but I don't know why for some reason it wasn't resonating. You would think they would care more than anybody else about the cost of textbooks and trying to do something about it. But it didn't really work that well. And so, Ultimately, I did have a student actually come forward who said, I found out that the library is trying to do something about expensive textbook costs, and I would like to be a part of that. And fortunately, this student was a transfer from a community college, and community colleges are doing, trying to do a lot with textbook affordability, and he was the president of the student government, and he had actually tried to start something, and he wanted to do something similar at Temple. And when he came to visit with me, his uh, primary goal was to start a revolution among the students and get them literally out into the streets screaming about textbook costs. And uh, I was able to talk the student down from that a little bit and said, maybe you should just start with trying to write a letter to the president of our college, our university and see if you can you know, get a meeting. Well, the president passed him on to the provost and the provost passed him on to an associate you know, vice president for undergraduate academic affairs. That person actually decided to start a textbook affordability group and I was able to help the student to shape a paper recommending what some of the topics should be and what some of the recommendations should be. And I think if we hadn't had that student come forward and create a catalyst or an impetus for the institution to do something and take a more serious look at what we need to do to get beyond where we are now and to involve more players in the process, I don't think it necessarily would have happened and I'm very worried. I mean, I love that the student is graduating, love student success, but now I'm worried about trying to find another student who can help us. And the fifth and final strategy I wanna share is hopefully not too difficult for us to achieve I mentioned the Lib OER group that is sort of an informal group of librarians who are, uh, have programs like these textbook affordability projects and are trying to advance the cause on their campuses. 
and we have some very interesting informal discussions once a month, and we also have a discussion list. And somebody shared on the discussion list a good question. Can anybody provide an example of a president or a provost who has written a letter to the faculty basically saying, look, we want textbook affordability to be an institutional priority here. And so for faculty, when you're making your decisions about what learning materials to assign to your students, please think about the affordability factor. And if you look at the Babson survey that was done uh, about a year or so ago, and they asked faculty when you're deciding what learning materials to use, what are the factors that you look at? And of course, things like quality, reputation of the author, they, those were at the top. Well, where was cost to students? Totally at the bottom. So we need to reshape that thinking. And I think a letter from your president or your provost could make a significant difference. And that's one of the things our textbook affordability group has as one of its recommendations to get our president and hopefully our provost to write that kind of letter and then get that message out to faculty that textbook affordability is something we care about and it's a priority and it's part of our mission to keep higher education affordable for our students. So just to wrap up, here's a couple of things that you can think about when you get back to your home institution. If you haven't done so already, try to get a sense of whether your campus is really ready to start a project to, a, to start a textbook revolution. Are people talking about this issue? I just was out in the hallway here with someone from an institution and they were actually telling me, we heard from our faculty, we heard from our students, they want us to do something about this. And they started, uh, they joined the Open Textbook Network, bringing others to campus to share their ideas. Don't make the same mistake we did and don't wait as long. I mean, there's a trade-off. If you want to start something right away, Great. If you want to have partners, it's going to take a little bit longer. You need to be patient. You need to form the coalition. There's more bureaucracy. But you probably will get further faster in the long run if you set up your partners and you have that coalition. Can't underestimate the power of having student activists involved and encouraging faculty and administrators to do something about this on your campus. There are now projects and groups like LibOER, Open Textbook Network, they can be really, really helpful for ideas and ways to get started on your campus. And again, don't reinvent the wheel. Look at what others have done. There's a lot of great examples out there. And as I mentioned in that last slide, try to get the support of your campus leaders. Now, we, did, we are members of the Open Textbook Network, and we had our workshop last week where they come out to your campus and they do a workshop for faculty and really anybody else that you want to hear more about the uh, open textbooks. And our presenter was Rajiv Janjiani. And Rajiv is, if, you, if you're you know, someone who's familiar with what's going on in the world of open textbooks and OER, you know Rajiv. He's this incredibly passionate professor of psychology at Kwatlan Polytechnic University in British Columbia and he's written wonderful things and he's an outspoken person about the importance of textbook affordability. And I really liked this quote I found in an interview that he had done with some local media about, yes, we care about the economic factor. We want our students to have an affordable higher education. We want them to be able to afford learning materials. And yes, we do care about their academic success and we do want them to learn and we don't want them to be turned off by boring textbooks. But more importantly than that, I like how Rajiv framed this as a social justice issue that some students can afford to buy all the textbooks that their faculty assign, whether they're going to read them or not. But there are many students on our campuses who cannot afford to buy these textbooks. And so therefore, we need to pay attention to the equality and the ability of all of our students to have equal access to learning content. So I think this is why we care and this is why we're doing this. So thank you for being here today, and we have some time for your questions, comments, discussions, or for you to tell us what you're doing on your campus to start a textbook revolution. Thank you.